preparation, making sure the boat is in top shape, everything's ready to go, and your safety gear is, you know, everything's in, in order. So nothing can ruin a day of fishing faster than have some kind of either boat failure or if, if things come to, you know, if you get a worst case scenario, not have all your safety equipment in check. Especially down here in South Florida, where the weather can change in minutes. You can go from a bluebird day to a real nasty thunderstorm in seconds and the wind could go from 10 knots to 40 knots like so. So you hear, you always hear about all these cases, people getting hurt or having accidents or mayday calls. Sometimes it's just mayday calls, but you know somebody's out there and they're having a rough time and maybe a little preparation could have avoided that. Uh, we, like Mark was saying, we spent so much money and time on getting everything else ready and sometimes we neglect the most important things, which are our safety gear. Agreed, 100%. Any questions? Yeah. And I think really just the importance of PFDs. A lot of times I see people who think to themselves, you know, well, if I go out on the water and something happens, I'll put it on. The bottom line is, you know, you never know when that rough weather could unexpectedly pop up and, you know, you're getting jostled around in the boat a little bit more than you'd like. So, yeah, it doesn't take, it, doesn't take long to have an accident, that's for sure. I got, no, I, and I think a lot of people don't realize. We got a question. Oh, awesome. Where do you guys recommend to keep your EPIRB? That's the question we got. Where do you guys keep your EPIRB at? I, me personally, um, uh, we keep, we have a ditch bag that we carry, so it's uh, available to us at all times at, at arm's length. Uh, we have a big boat, um, you know, so the opportunity to have one mounted as well is, is uh, when I say big, it's 39-foot quad engine uh, CV. So, you know, have one mounted inside a uh, console. A lot of them can be mounted on outside uh, of your console as well. Um, but we keep ours handy with the, uh, in, in in reach arms reach of it with a ditch bag uh, so that we can deploy it manually if we have to we keep our PLBs in our seat uh, and on our uh, on our PF uh, our personal flotation devices as well uh, I, a, I definitely say a key part of that is making sure everybody on the boat knows where that equipment is located um, personal flotation devices uh, you to wear them um, throw cushions fire extinguishers obviously the e or the, the beacons, make sure that everybody knows where they're at at all times. And I think taking advantage of the free vessel safety checks that are offered by I think a lot of people have this idea in their head that if they actually do the safety check, they're going to get ticketed. But that's actually, that's not the point of it. The point of it is to check and make sure that your boat is properly outfitted with all the safety gear that you need for the particular type of vessel that you have. Um, and I think that's true not just with the EPIR, but also with life preservers, throwable yeah. devices, air horns, fire extinguishers. You want all that stuff to be accessible. You also want everybody on the boat to know where that may be, just in case something happens to the captain. Well, then what are the, the others going to do? They need to know how to operate the radio, um, you know, in case of an emergency. God forbid something happened to the captain, now what? You know, uh, especially in my case where a lot of times I'm fishing with people never been out before, they have no clue. So they need to know, have an idea what to do in case of an emergency should it arise. Chris, we have a question for you. How far out offshore were you when you had to get rescued? What was your situation? We were about 25 miles offshore off the east coast, uh, Port Canaveral. Um, boat started taking on water. Um, we believe that the, the live well pump failed. We had water that was coming in the boat. Seas picked up, as was mentioned before, it went from a, a fairly calm day to uh, one to two foot seas, pretty spread out, three to four foot seas. So uh, the boat continued to take on water. We got to a point where we couldn't maneuver anymore. Um, and as was mentioned, it, it happens so quick. So having that plan, knowing where everything is, making sure that you're prepared yourself and everybody else is, is critical there. Um, we spoke about the Coast Guard before. Um, lifesavers for sure. They were a blessing to us. Um, still remember the, the side of the plane flying over us. The, the boat showed up and, and completely professional group of guys they were. Yeah. 
Mark and I were actually talking earlier about situations that arise and even though I've never had to personally use my EBRB, I had had a couple of close calls where for whatever reason, maybe like in your case, a pump failure or something that issue, a busted hose, you always think, do I have what I need to get through this or am I gonna, you know, am I gonna need it? But it's always nice to have it just in case. It's one of those things. You hope you don't ever have to use it. <laughs> Mark, I have a question. Um, your family's growing and growing fast. Uh, what considerations are you putting in place for safe voting for the kids? Well, you know, it's been really cool because my children have grown up in it. Crockett, my youngest son, is actually a licensed captain, got his captain's license at 19, and uh, really proud of that. You know, and I've got three grandchildren, and, um, you know, so as they grow, the importance of, of making sure they got PFDs that, that um, you know, fit them and, and uh, making sure that we have all that safety gear and, and uh, you know, and, and, you know, that they're prepared and we're prepared in case something were to happen, you know. And the biggest thing is that, you know, the safety aspect of it, that's huge for us, but making sure that they understand that the opportunity to spend time on the water and learning to love a sport and appreciating and respecting the environment and the way in which, you know, as long as we keep it healthy for our children, our, our children's children. I mean, that's critical. You respect what you catch. I, fit, I eat fish. I don't mind killing a fish, but I don't kill more fish than I can eat or friends want it and that kind of thing. So those types of things and treating and teaching our children and our grandchildren how to truly appreciate what we have. And the more that we can do that, the more that people pay attention to those small things, you know, the, the longer and the longevity of what we do is, is so good, it's so critical to make sure that everyone can be out here and enjoy it. I don't care if you're in North Carolina, Florida, uh, it, it really, New Mexico, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's uh, all the things that we need to do uh, to protect our environment and, and appreciate our families and friends and people that are in the industry and all of you that are here who are, who are uh, so passionate about what well, you wouldn't be here if you weren't passionate about water sports and that kind of thing so you know being able to appreciate that is just critical and I think that's what I want to teach as a father and a grandfather those are the things that mean so much to me I get emotional thinking about my dad and the things that he taught me and it, it, things you can't replace you know, there's nothing that you can replace, money or anything else, nothing replaces the time that you have with your family and friends and the ability to be out uh, and, and something that God's given us and we, you know, know how to appreciate. You know, it's pretty special. So true. I agree with you 100%, Mark. My grandfather taught me how to fish in the lakes of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and, and those are memories that I'll cherish forever. And, you know, at the industry breakfast yesterday, I heard a stunning statistic, and that statistic was that 62% of kids have not been involved in one outdoor activity, and that's data from the year 2014, and to me, that's just, it's jaw-dropping. We need to keep our families, and we need to keep mentoring and get the next generation involved and educate them on safety, on our environment, on how to be better stewards of an, our environment how to be conscious of conservation. Those things are so very important. But, you know, mentoring, I mean, and spending that time on the water, those are memories, outdoor experiences that kids will take with them for the rest of their lives. So, I know I remember mine, you know, and, when, right? uh, you know, the opportunity to have just those special times, it's so good and, you know, caught some great fish over the years. I mean, we've all had wonderful catches and things like that, so, you know, I mean, I kind of get into some of the fishing side of things. I mean, you know, uh, you know, I, I'd like to hear what some of these guys, what their biggest fish are, some of the crazy things that's happened to them on the water over <laughs> the years. And, you know, so uh, so whatever you guys can tell. I know you've caught uh, over a 10-pound largemouth is what I hear. It was 10 pounds, 6 ounces. Not that I was, you know, paying close <laughs> attention or anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was, that was a super exciting experience. But I have to say that, you know, the whole time I was thinking about my grandfather and all those memories. So Yeah, you never just, had that experience if he hadn't have taken you. You know, there's a lot of people not. fish all their life that never even come close to catching a 10-pound largemouth bass. No, and I think, you know, now in today's digital age, we're so connected to our electronic devices. And we need, our families need that bonding time on the water. We need that time to decompress, 
to just, you know, spend time together and remember what it was like to actually socialize and have fun and, and learn new skills and techniques out there on the water. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I think one of the greatest things about our sport is that no matter how much you think you know, I bet every day you guys go out on the water, you learn something new. Every right. day. Oh, I, right. I learned stuff new from my, my son. Uh, my God, he's, uh, he's an amazing fisherman, way better fisherman than I'll ever be. And, you know, so it's cool for me to sit around and watch what the developments happened uh, for him over the years. And, and um, you know, they teach me. He teaches me. I just get in the way. I'm the bills boy now. I let them take <laughs> care of uh, all, all the fun stuff and all the fishing. So, um, you know, that's that's fun to watch. It's fun to see, you know. So much so. Yeah. I, I have to say that it's you're absolutely right. The one thing I can assure you is that it's a never-ending process. Yeah. From the time I started fishing as a young boy growing up here, Things have changed so much, and even after I got involved in offshore sport fishing, which we're going back probably close to 30 years now, the developments have just, a lot of things have changed from the way we fish to the techniques we use and how we do it. Everything's become faster, you know, uh, tighter, more precise, uh, technical. The electronics have totally changed the game. Uh, you can do things now, you can even imagine doing earlier so there has been a lot of advances and a lot of changes but the one thing that has been constant is that you constantly have to evolve with the sport you can't just say i know all i need to know and i'm done that's one of the beauties of it is that it's a lifelong thing and the beauty of it is that you're never ever finished you never fully master it as a matter of fact a lot of times when i meet somebody for the first time and fishing comes up I usually like to see what they say, and usually if they tell me, oh, I know everything there is to know, that tells me right away they know nothing. When somebody says, well, I know some, but I'm, I've got a lot to learn, that usually means they're being honest with you, and they know enough to realize they don't know. <laughs> I'm not scared to touch a live bait, at least, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's good stuff. So, Chris, in your world, man, what's... Uh, Tell us some good stuff about the uh, big fish you've caught. Well, the, probably the highlight of my fishing right now is much like you. My son is very involved on the bass scene. He's uh, currently fishing. He's fishing a tournament right now for uh, high school bass. So we've traveled all over the state. Fortunately, we've been um, up to Alabama for the world's uh, national finals for high school fishing. So a lot of good things there. Personally, um, I still get to fish a little bit myself. Um, not as much as uh, I've been able to, but um, my personal best is a 12 and a half pound bass. Oh man! Nice. Nice. You we, smoke me. <laughs> we we got a question over here. Very interesting question. So I know we have a, a AIS link available, and this I believe this question will fall in line with it. What's your question? Hi. Hopefully this is maybe a lighthearted question. You talked about family and friends going out on the water. Well, dogs are a really big part of the family and friend traveling pack, so to say. Sure. Do you have any recommend any recommendations for introducing a dog for the first time on the boat, or are there devices or any devices or how to introduce the dog into the first time going on the boat? You know, I. That's a good question. It's one that I need to learn. I, you know, I'm not familiar with that. However, if it's part of your family, then I treat them just like a kid. You know, find some find a, find a PFD that fits them as well. I mean, you know, you're talking about uh, if you're out offshore. I mean, they need protection as well. And certainly, um, you know, if that's important to you, if that if that you know dog is important to you, I would treat it just exactly like I would one of my children. And uh, you know, I mean. I think that's critical for you to feel comfortable as well. That's the biggest. If you feel comfortable, and you're and you're going to have a better time if you know that loved one is out there with you and they're being taken care of, and you've done everything that you can to take care of them. By all means, you're going to have more time on the water, whether you're fishing, life rafting, sunbathing, whatever it may be, and it'll be a whole lot more of a pleasurable experience for you. You're all right. right. We got another question. Okay. All right. How you doing? Uh, I guess I have an old EPER, and I'm wondering how do I resurface it? How do I recertify it? That's that's a great question, and I know it's one Nicole can answer. I know that that is possible because I had an old one, had a battery replaced in it as well, and if I'm not mistaken, it can be recertified, right? Uh, yes, it can. If you want to. 
It, it can. Um, you may want to consider just moving on to a new beacon at this uh, okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, honestly, it's... I'm sorry. Yeah. Right now, we've got uh, EPIRBs that are under $400 during the show, and they've got a 10-year battery. I'm guessing your battery is only five years, four years. Yeah, so when you do all the math, you might as well make the jump. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he does have a raffle ticket, so he might walk away with a new one today. He, yeah, you might win one if you got a raffle ticket. Anyone who doesn't have one yet can grab one. We're uh, Raffling away ACR and Ocean Signal beacons. Uh, we also have giveaways from Universo Marino, uh, which is one of the few or only really uh, Spanish fishing radio shows and magazines. And Captain O over here is actually an editor for the magazine um, and does the radio show. You're, you're a frequent guest, right? Regular, so to speak? As guest. Guest, yeah. But they've become so much more affordable. I mean, that's uh, over the last 10 years. I mean, it, ACR's done a great job of making them affordable to, uh, you know, the, the uh, recreational fishermen and, and boater. We got, a, we got another question over here. Um, how did the Kingfish Cup weekend go? The All right, hold on, hold on. Kingfish question right here, right. The Kingfish Cup championship weekend, um, how did that go? Did you have any problems with the championship? I'm sorry, what was the last part of it? Uh, the problems you had in winning the championship. The problems that we experienced at the championship at uh, the Kingfish Cup. Yeah, we had a, uh, <clears throat> the Kingfish Cup for this young man that uh, we won the, the uh, uh, what's called the Kingfish Cup. It's a big event uh, out of North Carolina. Uh, won about $100,000 in this event in November. And um, we experienced an issue. We were what started this, and I alluded to this when we first started, I was 95 miles offshore and had two mounting bolts on the top. I've run a 39 CV with quad Mercury 350s, so the, the two top mounting bolts somehow got loose and sheared off. So the, one of the motors, uh, an 800-pound motor almost, well, 680, uh, came off, leaned off of the transom and fell down about four inches. Um, so it really kind of ended up fishing day because getting back, and we were in eight, well, it started off at about five to six, and so we had to start heading back in shore with the motor trimmed up, cinched off and tied off to midship. So at six knots, even though we have all this horsepower, this motor's sitting back there bouncing, and so we couldn't go very fast, and as the night rolled on, it was 11 o'clock at night, pitch black, and it's 10-foot seas coming over the, coming over the T-top. So, that kind of predicated into the next weekend was the Kingfish Cup Championship. And, uh, you know, I had to, uh, we had to uh, borrow uh, a, a boat because we were getting the motor issue taken care of. So the, uh, that's kind of how that led up to that. And then the Kingfish Cup was horrible weather. North Carolina is known for uh, being difficult at times if you're a fisher person. And, um, you know, so fortunately the, day, the, the tournaments were postponed days and then long and short of it we fished on Sunday in a borrowed boat and it was rough and uh, we, we fished four spots <clears throat> before we finally found the right fish. Now it wasn't the biggest fish in the ocean but they were two the two biggest fish in the event and uh, it was an exciting time. It was a nail biter because we didn't hear of many other fish being caught so we weren't really sure uh, where we were but we were the third from the last boat to weigh in that day and it's pretty uh, uh, prominent event in our area um, it, uh, specified to certain you know uh, qualifications and that kind of thing and so we caught a uh, 24 35 and a 35.9 and it's a little over 60 pounds and won us uh, almost 100 grand so it was pretty awesome. exciting it was a pretty exciting time and you know we've had our share like I said before we've had our share of success over the years but we've also had our share of failures but we always go even though you get frustrated I hope that answered your question. <laughs> I uh, wonder if Debbie um, can share with us a little bit. Her and I just had a nice lunch where we were talking about how the fishing and boating community is becoming a little to a lot more female and how our perspective of getting ready for fishing and what we do is different and talk about some of the outreach and that fun event you went to the other night and how women are making fishing and the sport our own. 
Yeah, definitely. So I think, you know, obviously women are one of the fastest growing demographics in our industry. More women are getting out there. They're getting out there on their own. They're striving to learn more about the sport. Um, that's what I was just talking to Nicole about, an event that I went to with the Nature Coast Lady Anglers. They're up in the Ocala area. And they did a really fun, neat educational event called Hook, Wine, and Sinker. So they had it at one of the ladies' homes. They had three stations set up where one, they learned a terminal knot, a line-to-line -line knot, and then an arbor knot to connect their line to their reel. So they knew, you know, the three key knots that you need to know to be able to set up your own gear. They had a blast, you know, learning and, and socializing. And I think really, you know, the key to getting more women involved and keeping them involved is to give them more support. Um, and also to keep providing them with educational opportunities and help them see themselves outdoor, outdoors participating in these activities. Um, you know, I think one of the things a lot, I, I shouldn't say a lot, I should say one of the things that some of us in this industry tend to do from time to time without even realizing it is we like to talk about a lot of the exciting fancy lures and techniques that we use, but when it comes down to it, Fishing really can be so simple, and you don't need to have a lot of, you know, expensive, fancy gear to get started doing it, and you can just get out there. Most all of us, I know we were talking at lunch, and most all of us started fishing from shore when we were kids, and that just, you know, like you were saying earlier, Orlando, it just kept progressing evolves. and evolves, and your, your quest to learn more becomes greater and greater, and you keep, you know, your excitement level builds, and when you've got camaraderie, and you've got other people to get out there on the water with and learn from, it just makes that much more of an impression. And I think that, you know, we, the women that are in this industry, the ones that I see as being, you know, really successful, one of their key, you know, one of their key philosophies is we got to keep mentoring each other and encouraging each other. And it's really so true. We got a question over here. Oh, uh, bow fishing? It's not big out here. Bow fishing. Bow fishing. Bow fishing. Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't bow fish personally. Um, so yeah, it's. Does anybody here have experience with bow fishing? I do not. I, I personally don't, do don't, but I've got a, uh, got a good friend in North Carolina who, uh, who, who, who's big into charter, uh, charter fishing with uh, bow fishing. Uh, a lot of rays and things like that. That's a, becoming larger and larger uh, sport, and uh, you know they, he, he does it. And they're good eating, so. You did say bonefish, right? Oh. Bow. 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 Bow fish. Yeah, with a bow and arrow. With a bow and arrow. We're not opposed yep. to learning from our audience. Can you share anything with us on bow fishing? Said Ray. <laughs> come on up. You need a head. Yeah, 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 come, come on, on up. up. <laughs> in Chicago and he does a lot of bow fishing and the Asian carp are a big problem up in Illinois. Yep, They're an yep. invasive species so I know that a lot of people inc really encourage bow fishing for those invasives yep. because so, you know ho the hope is it helps to control and curtail that population. We have a river and so gar when it floods they get into the lake so they're really big on getting the gar and gar is yeah. not easy to hit. They're really long and narrow and when you do hit one it's it's exciting. Pretty exciting. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Do you know where CV Boats is located? CV Boats are located off Pier 6 all the way to the end. Pier 6. Off the Palmetto. Hey, hey, it's the one you're going to want to buy, I promise. <laughs> or off the Palmetto, too. 
<laughs> you know, <clears throat> also another cool thing about fishing, you get to see things that, you know, you watch on television, you know, you watch the National, or National Geo uh, Channel and things like that. We've had, as we, we had a conference call earlier this week about this event that we're doing today and talked about some cool things that we've seen on the water. You know, we've had an opportunity to see some things that you might not ever see. And the one, and I got to thinking about this as we were talking about it, some of the most unusual or the coolest things we've seen. You know, and I believe it was in 2005, my son Crockett, his memory's way better than mine, but we were across the shoals in Cape Lookout up in North Carolina. And you know, we were out, uh, we were out fishing for stripers, if I'm not mistaken, because the striped stripe bass had come in. And um, long as, you know, which doesn't happen a lot right where we live in North Carolina, but they had that at that year. Well, you know, we looked around, and at that time, we video and, and, and take a lot of photos now, but at that time, we didn't have video camera on the boat. But none of us will ever forget a great white shark swimming up to our boat. I had a 25-foot contender, and this thing was well over half the length of that. So we're probably talking about a fish that was 16 to 18 feet huge girth, huge back, and you know, you, you, you see that stuff on TV, you see jaws and things like that, but those are the kinds of things that I might not ever get to see again, but you know what, you don't know unless you go. That's the one thing, I don't care if you're catching fish, looking for birds, it doesn't matter. There's so many things that you can see and enjoy on the water, um, you know, and, and those are the experiences that stick with you for a long time. I remember those types of things better than I do whether if we won a tournament sometimes and, and you know as far as images go of course you always like seeing money in your bank account but uh, but when it comes to the images of things and seeing a humpback whale breach and the tail come out of the water and catching those types of photos and we were out <clears throat> Crockett and I were out in our bay boat which we got a 27 foot CV bay boat about five weeks ago we were in 20 feet of water and I did a live Instagram feed that had a humpback whale in less than 20 feet of water off the coast of North Carolina. You know, wow. and that's something that you just can't buy. And it's one of those things that's so fun and so exciting. And you know, and that's the things that I experience. I talk a lot about family, but that's really what it was. I was with my kid. It's and like, uh, he's not a kid anymore. He's a grown man, 21 years old. But, it's like that you country know, song. It, it's, it's really, really fun to be out there. So do yourselves a favor, get out on the water, be prepared. You know, be safe, all these things. And it's, you know, it's a lot of fun, a lot of good opportunity. You're in a great place to experience a lot of things. Don't waste the money when you can put it into safety.